Have the Panthers truly been stubborn about running the football? Is this the worst defense in franchise history? And how are the rookies looking so far? These are the questions that you have and the questions I'm going to answer in this weekly Wednesday mailbag edition of Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Lockdown Panthers podcast, the part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Your team every day. That's our motto here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Subscribe or follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter at Julian council where on Wednesdays like today I'm here answering your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions I'm going to be doing this every Wednesday throughout the entirety of the regular season so what I need you to do is either at me or DM me and if you feel so inclined you can also follow me on Twitter at Julian Council it's not required to ask me a question just at me or DM me after the game on Sunday and get those questions in by about four or five o'clock on Tuesday when I typically record for Wednesday's show. This episode of Locked On Panthers is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com, just locked on NFL and use code all lowercase locked on NFL to win $50 instantly. When you play $5, the weekly Wednesday mailbag is back. And there is much concern when looking at the Carolina Panthers defense. Through five weeks. Week one was brutal. Week two wasn't much better. Week three, all right. Andy Dalton, offense looked good. Maybe the defense was re-energized. They actually believed that the offense would score points, so they gave a better effort. Then week four, okay, um, not great, but it's Joe Burrow. It's the Bengals. And in week five, oh, man, right back down to earth as the Panthers defense was just brutal against a Bears team, giving up 27 points in the first half. The Bears had scored at most 24 points in a game so far that season. So, yeah, it was rough on Sunday, and that's leading Jake to ask me, is this the worst Panthers defense in franchise history? 30 seasons of Carolina Panthers football. We are five games into the 30th season, and so far – This has been one of the worst, but actually through five games, the worst defense in Panthers history as they've given up a record 165 games in the first five games of the season. Pro Football Reference, a website I like to go and look at a lot of stats. That's where I can get my stats as far as yards per play and just simple things like that, but also I'm seeing success rate and a lot of other things. They have their own little metric where it's called the simple rating system. 0.0 is the average of a team and how they perform on offense, defense, and just overall. And I wanted to see what their system said about the Panthers' defenses historically because not a lot of times you can go back and look at EPA numbers all the way back to the beginning of the franchise back in 95. But looking at this season and – all the seasons the Panthers had before over on Pro Football Reference and their simple rating system, the Panthers' defense so far in the first five games have a minus 10.9 rating after the first five games of the season. 2019 is the worst defense, according to Pro Football Reference, the Panthers have ever had at a minus 5.1. That defense allowed the 31st most points in the NFL, but also somehow had 53 sacks that season. And they were one of the best sack total teams in the league. And that defense, that was the last year of Ron Rivera when he was told by the owner, David Tepper, no more of this 4-3 nonsense. In Pittsburgh, a real franchise, we were on a 3-4. So Ron Rivera had to go call the plays and try to go get personnel to fit a 3-4 defense in one offseason. Luke Keekley was still around. James Bradley Barry was still around. Mario Addison was, brought, was around. They brought in Gerald McCoy, also brought in Bruce Irvin. Eric Reed was on the team. And the Panthers, well, really struggled against the run that year and gave up a ton of points. And that's also the year where they lost eight straight games in the season. Ron Rivera was fired after their fourth straight loss at the second half of the season. Four games left into the season when Perry Fuel took over. So that defense was not very good. But that was a defense where 
You got a Hall of Famer, Luke Keekley. Uh, James Bradbury went on to be a really good player, both in New York with the Giants and in Philadelphia, the Eagles. Mario Addison has, had his success here, went to Buffalo, had success there. Gerald McCoy was a great player in Tampa Bay. They had proven players that were, yes, older, but still, they had some guys that were pretty damn good. Like, they have a dude who's going to have a bust in Canton. I'm looking at the Panthers' defense right now. There are some experienced players, but have any of the guys, like Sean Robinson, did he have success in his career? So far, like Joe McCoy, absolutely not. They don't have an edge rush. Like Mario Addison was a pretty good edge rusher here and like fairly consistent. And the Panthers just do not have that on this team so far this season. So that defense was not great. 2021 was also not a great defense. They had a minus 4.4 rating. And then you look at Actually, that was 2001, excuse me. I wrote 2021, 2001. 2001 had a minus 4.4 rating. You'll remember that team won their first game, then lost 15 straight. That's objectively hilarious that that happened. Uh, 2010, they were a minus 4.1. That team only won two games. So looking at it so far, the Panthers' defense is by far the worst that they have ever had through five games and is on pace to allow 561 points 2019 allowed 470 and remember only 16 games the nfl teams played back then so they might have given up right around 500 points and still this team would give up at least two games worth more with an extra game if they end up continuing to give up 33 points per game like we've seen so far so yeah don't have a pass rush. Can't stop the run. Shaq Thompson's done for the season. Derek Brown's done for the season. It feels like this is going to be, just based off of the four brutal games we've seen, the worst defense in franchise history. And I take no pleasure in saying that as people are wondering, you know, what's that going to mean for Jero Averro? I had someone ask me about Robert Sala being fired by the Jets and maybe he could be the coordinator for the Panthers next season, possibly. But Robert Sala is someone who's going to have options and he had a really good defense in New York. He was not the problem as far as the defense wasn't the problem. It seems like the offense is the issue there in New York and he had a great defense in San Francisco. Is he going to want to come to Carolina where you look at the talent level? It's not great. I think it's a big reason why Jero Vero and his team are having a tough time so far getting off the field and really just getting guys just on the ground so far this season. So, yeah, this has been a pretty brutal defense so far this season. Now, Chuck is asking me a question. A lot of people have been asking me, and quite honestly, I got this question the first preseason game against the Patriots when the Panthers were playing all their backups, a bunch of guys who aren't even on the roster. Folks are all upset, being, oh, here we go again. It's like, why are you upset by a bunch of guys who aren't even going to make the team? Uh, like Badera Traore. Lasted like, what, 10 more days, if even that. But Chuck is asking me, is it Farmer's Market Sunday yet? And if y'all have been watching the show, listening to the show for a while, you know, at a certain point in time, I kind of tell you, I don't kind of, I flat out just tell you, if it's going to upset you to watch this team, just don't watch because they're not going to provide anything entertainment-wise for you moving forward. And unfortunately, the three seasons prior to this season I've been doing the show, the Panthers have rarely given us much to watch and to uh, be excited about uh, to really want to stick around every Sunday. They start up 3-0 and my first year doing it. Then they fell apart as Chris McCaffrey got injured, a bunch of injuries on the offensive line, and Sam Darnold also, he struggled and came came back. It was a fun 10 days, but it wasn't great. 2022 started off 1-5. and Matt Rule was fired, but then they turned things around, and it was time to start watching the Panthers again. Then last year, yeah, well – Farmers Market Sunday came early as they start off 0 6 heading into that bye. But right now, yeah, the Panthers are sitting at 1 and 4. Yes, things appear to be bleak after the hope and excitement of Andy Dalton taking over at quarterback and the offense being functional. But we're finding out, some of you are finding out, I try to tell you, the defense is no good. And it's hard to believe it's going to get better considering the amount of injuries that are piling up on the side of the ball and some of the players that haven't even played a snap so far defensively for Carolina. But if you look at it, though, and I told Chuck this uh, during uh, our DM conversation over on Twitter. If the Saints lose to the Chiefs on Monday, which they did, and if they then turn around and beat the Bucs, now the status of Derek Carr will be important throughout the week to figure out what the deal is there as he suffered an oblique injury in that loss to Kansas City. But the Saints beat the Bucs, and then the Panthers find a way to hold down the Falcons and get a win at home. That's going to make the Saints 3-3, three and three, the Bucs 3-3, three and three, and the Falcons three and three, and then the Panthers two and four. The Panthers 
are one game out of first place after six weeks. No, I'm not going to be calling for a farmer's market Sunday. That's far too early. And then they would go on the road against Washington, a team that has looked pretty good, but also defensively haven't been that stout. I do think eventually that uh, Dan Quinn's going to get that to be one of the better defenses in the league. But right now, until like it really feels like not even mathematically possible for them to make the playoffs, but like it's got to be to the point where, okay, clearly this thing's not going to be headed towards any sort of excitement as far as playoff. But there's also things to watch. Like last year, like you want to see the development of Bryce Young. Didn't really get to see that. This year, you're going to see Xavier Lee get. Hopefully, he'll be healthy. Trevin Wallace, there are some things to look at with this team to hope for a brighter future, but totally understand that, yeah, it's it's been rough, and you've been watching a lot of rough Panther football over the last couple of years. You'll know. I'll tell you when it's Farmer's Market Sunday and when, if you decide to go spend your day outside and enjoy the beautiful weather here in Charlotte or wherever you are, I won't begrudge you at all for doing it. I already have the draft saved on twitter it will be a stock image of two people at a farmer's market and then you'll know but right now no we're not there and if they lose on sunday and they're one and five well it will feel like it's where they need to be at that point where it's farmer's market sunday but only two years ago panthers are one and five turned things around and right there week 17 had an opportunity to win the division and just fell short so we've seen turnarounds before maybe we'll see a turnaround again this season but no, it's not time for Farmer's Market Sunday. I'll let you know when it happens. But I don't think it's going to happen just yet. All right, we'll take a quick pause. I'll come back here and answer more of your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions right here on Locked On Panthers. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Prize picks is the best way to get action on sports in over 30 states, including California, Florida, Georgia, Texas, and of course, the old North State here in North Carolina. Sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize picks is the best way to win real money this football season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Make your picks in less than 60 seconds and turn your sports opinions into real money all season long on prize picks. Download the app today and use code locked on NFL to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. That's code locked on NFL. You get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. Prize picks run your game. All right, let's get back to your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions here on Locked on Panthers. Sean asking about the rookie class so far, saying we played roughly a third of the season so far. I feel like we've had a chance to look at most of our higher draft picks and see if they have at least shown flashes of being able to play at an NFL level. Xavier Leggett has shown flashes that he can handle being a wide receiver, too, at the very least. Trevor Wallace had 15 total tackles in his first NFL start. And looked great in the preseason. JT Sanders has been pretty underwhelming so far. Jonathan Brooks was touted to be one of the most NFL ready running backs coming out of college. This draft class sets a tone for the future of Dan Morgan's GM career. How would you grade his first draft solely based on what we've seen so far? What I've seen so far. Um, yeah, Xavier Leggett. We'll start off with him. Panthers decided to trade up to the first round to get Leggett and also to build the fifth year option uh, at the time. Did not necessarily love doing that because they could have just waited. But OK, hey, if he turns out to be a good player, then you're able to save some money with the fifth year option. The thing is, he's got to prove it first before we even really have that conversation, which we'll have in a couple of years time through the first couple of se- weeks of the season. He has 13 receptions, 151 yards and a touchdown it was the guy who had four receptions in his debut against the Saints then did not get targeted. Against the Chargers had a couple of receptions there on the road against Las Vegas. Then got to step into a role in week four against Cincinnati at home where he was that number two guy and really impressed in that first half. And then had a couple of tough drops there in the second half that killed some Panther drives. And then last week had the one reception, got injured with his shoulder, and we're still waiting on his status for the rest of the week and whether he'll be able to play on Sunday, I just think that there still needs to be more seen from him in terms of just like we got to just give be a little bit more patient because recall, like this is a guy who did not play in during OTAs. He had a couple practices, injured his hamstring. Panthers were taking things slow, so I didn't really get to see him during that portion of the offseason. 
Then you get down to training camp, has a foot injury. They hold him out for about a week. He only played in one preseason game, and that preseason game on the road against Buffalo had a drop in his own his lone target. So we didn't really get to see Xavier Leggett until week one, and it wasn't really until week four when he was put into a role to be one of the guys. And now we're wondering what the situation is going to be with his injuries. Like that's really what's held him back so far. And I'm not saying that had he not been injured, that he would have came out and been just excellent for the Panthers. I just don't know that. But so far, like, yeah, we saw the flashes, especially that week, um, that opening or that first half, rather, God, with the words, the first half against Cincinnati. It's like, all right, okay, this is something you can work with with Xavier Lee get. And we'll see, depending on what the Panthers' desires are, what the market is for some of the players that they have, in particular Adam Thielen and Deontay Johnson, if there's more opportunities later on the season for Xavier Lee get. But I've liked what I've seen from him when he's had opportunities so far this season. Jonathan Brooks, obviously, you can't give that anything other than an incomplete since he has not played. It is uh, unfortunate the Panthers decided to take him there in the second round when um, <laughs> the way Chuba Hubbard's playing, I don't even know what role Jonathan Brooks is going to play whenever he is healthy. Now, Dave Canales says that he's really close. Uh, what does that mean? Because we've been told for the longest time that he would be available at the beginning of training camp, that he'd be available uh, the first, first couple of weeks of the season. Then, oh, well, he's not available. He's on the NFI list, non-football injury, and they're not opening up the window for him here in week six. So it feels like we're not going to see this guy until like Kansas City, and that's after the bye week if we really see him at all this season. Uh, Trevin Wallace played well, 15 tackles, 10 of them solo, was the fifth highest graded defender defender for the Panthers, according to PFF in that game on Sunday. Just one of those things where he's only had one game to really step in to that role, so got to give it more time. JT Sanders, yes, has been a disappointment, has been the second lowest graded offensive player. In fact, that Bryce Young's been benched with Sanders. I, it may have changed because Bryce Young actually had a pretty good grade on Sunday in that game on that one drive, and that may as uh, – let me go ahead and just look at this while I'm up here with y'all on offense to see – nope, has not changed. But JT Sanders has a 41.2 overall grade for the Panthers so far. Bryce Young is a 36.3. Some other guys, Tommy Trimble is only 44.7. Mingo, 47.3. So, yeah, right now JT Sanders has been one of the worst offensive players. And small sample size, Jalen Coker right now is the highest graded offensive player at an 80.5 uh, grade right now. Chuba Hubbard, 78.5, just kind of giving some context there. I mean, Felipe Franks is considered one of their top offensive players, according to PFF. That's just one way to look at it. When you see some of those things like that, you kind of roll your eyes. Like, okay, uh, Felipe Franks, one of the top three offensive players in Carolina. Clearly, that's not the case. But, uh, yeah, it has been kind of a rough go for JT Sanders. But we talked to Jonathan Davis of Locked on Longhorns, and he kind of told us that he thought he could be a good player, but it was going to take some time. They're going to need to be patient with him, and we're seeing that that certainly needs to be the case. Looking at everybody else, uh, I mean, Shaw Smith Wade has only played 26 defensive snaps, so hard to give him a grade. Jaden Crumity has not played, and Michael Barrett is not a Carolina Panther. I believe he's on the Browns practice squad after being traded to the Seahawks for Mike Jackson, then being cut there in Seattle. So, really, there's only been there's only two guys, I mean, three guys who are in a position right now to really um, produce for Carolina: Lee Gat, Wallace, and Sanders. And I still think it's way too early. Uh, thinking about it too down the road with the let's see the buy that might be the time to really go look at where those guys are as the Panthers will be what 10 11 games into the season by that point and that will be a better barometer of where exactly those guys are so bookmark that for the future here on the show uh question coming over here from Bo asking about Dave Canales and where the run game is saying, I was wondering why coach Canales hasn't been stubborn with the run game. Are they preventing Chuba from cashing in on a big contract extension on purpose? Do you foresee that changing this week versus Atlanta? Well, I don't think the Panthers are trying to keep Chuba Hubbard from making money when he becomes a free agent in March. I don't think that's the case at all. Also, he plays running back. So I think the fact that he's a running back, is what would keep him from getting a big contract extension as teams don't want to pay running backs anymore. And y'all, of course, know how I feel about this federal minimum wage. Um, but I don't know about whether it's going to change this week. And a big key to all of this has just been the offensive struggles and being able to stay on the field. And Dave Canales said this on Monday after reviewing the game tape from the loss in Chicago, talking about how 
they weren't able to convert on third down. They were 0-7 on third and manageable, and that did not allow them to stay on the field and to be able to get to some of the offensive things they had done the weeks prior against Cincinnati and Las Vegas. When they were converting on third down and staying on the field against Las Vegas, they were able to run the football. Same thing with Cincinnati. They could run the ball, and Chuba Hubbard had two games where he had over 100 yards rushing back-to-back for the first time in his career, and he only came up three yards short, but you, on Sunday – in Chicago, but you still would like to see him get more than 13 carries, especially when he was the only offense the Panthers had all day long. And you have your right guard, Robert Hunt, coming out after the game saying the only thing we did well was run the football. So, yeah, it would be nice to see us run the football some more. Right now, just looking at third down, the Panthers are converting only 28.3% of their third down. So that's 28th in the NFL. Now, if you want to just look at since Andy Dalton's been the quarterback the last three weeks, they are converting 39.47% of their third downs, which is still not great. A lot better than 28.3%. That is good for 16th in the NFL since Andy Dalton took over. And had Dalton been the quarterback the whole time, it would only be 17th in the NFL. So they'd be right there, middle of the road of Andy Dalton as a starting quarterback when it comes to converting third downs, had he been the guy the whole time. Now, looking at some other things, like the team is 22nd in rushing attempts. Chuba Hubbard is 15th in the NFL in attempts. He has 68. Jordan Mason, who's filling in for Christian McCaffrey there in San Francisco, leads the league with 105. And I think he also is the league's leading rusher because he's been getting a ton of attempts. And San Francisco obviously has a great run scheme and good offensive line. I just think that moving forward, the Panthers really need to lean on that run game because that is the best facet of their game. And when they go up against good defenses like they did on Sunday, where that defense only really needs to worry about Deontay Johnson as being the guy who can really beat them. And I know you likely get and what he can provide in the future and even what he can provide right now, but he has not done anything in the league for any of these defensive minds to really be that concerned about him. Yes, they know about his speed and all that, but he's got to be able to catch the football. And he had some struggles doing that a couple weeks ago. Not saying that's going to be a uh, recurring issue, but still these defensive coordinators don't necessarily need to respect the rookie right now, especially against this Panthers offense where there's not a ton of other guys out there that can hurt you. And it's not like Deontay Johnson necessarily is going over the top that much uh, on the lot. They he had some catches uh, we saw against Cincinnati or these opportunities, but still I think that's one of the things where they just need to lean a run game, be able to get some play action off of that. And of course, stay on the field if we want to see more of the run, but yeah, I, I still I, I understand where you're coming from, Bo. I had somebody else sending me the graphic that Marcus Mosier, who's the host of Locked On Raiders, sorry, Locked On Cowboys, put out there about success rate. And I shared that number with you as Chuba Hubbard leaves the NFL in success rate. You would just think that for a coach who came out and said on Monday that their running efficiency was at 65 percent. Why would they not continue to run the football more based off of that number? We'll find out whether that changes in the next coming weeks. All right, I'll take another quick pause here and come back and answer the rest of your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions right here on Locked On Panthers. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. And looking over at FanDuel right now, Panthers, Falcons, 425 on a Sunday, a late game. The Panthers are six and a half point underdogs plus 235 money line over under is set at 47 and a half. And you can always go on and pick some alt spreads if you want to pick total points, all that, some same game parlays, all the kind of stuff that you would want to look at over on FanDuel. And when you do, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Time is our most precious commodity, so don't waste it scrolling through the same mind-numbing content for hours and hours. How can you spend it wisely to improve yourself? Our sponsor, Hillsdale College, is offering more than 40 free, that's right, free online courses. Here are a few courses that are available right now. Constitution 101, The Meaning and History of the Constitution, Introduction to Free Market Economics, the Great American Story, A Land of Hope, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic. All of Hillsdale's courses are self-paced so that you can start whenever and tune in wherever. Plus, you can go deeper with readings, 
quizzes, discussions, or just enjoy the lectures, go right now to hillsdale.edu slash locked on to enroll. There's no cost, and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash locked on to register. Hillsdale.edu slash locked on. All right, a few more questions here in this weekly Wednesday mailbag edition of Locked on Panthers. Now over to Rod, who asked me a question about the draft decision the Panthers made back in 2021. Rod saying, seeing that Patrick Sertain and Micah Parsons play like future Hall of Famers, is it safe to say J.C. Horn was the wrong selection at number eight? In recent years, it seems the Panthers prioritized drafting their favorite players over the higher player on Mel Kuyper's big board. Well, yeah, I mean, the Panthers should draft their favorite players because those are the guys that they feel like fit their system and are the top of their board. And they shouldn't be looking at what Mel Kiper Jr. And he has to say over there on ESPN like that. That would be ridiculous. Now, I understand, like as fans and as consumers of the product, you're going to look at what he has up there. And I obviously bring it up here on the show. But that does not mean it's going to reflect the board that each team in the NFL has. So I don't think that's a fair way to look at things as I mean, Mel Kiper Jr. has done a really good job. He's basically built the whole NFL draft industrial complex, which I hate, but really nice guy worked on a show a couple of times and worked at ESPN radio uh, back in the day, really good dude. Um, but like he doesn't work for an NFL team and he's not out there drafting players. Yes. He's evaluating players, but he's not making this, these decisions in the war room. And maybe if he was, it's possible that these teams would be doing better or they could be doing worse or maybe the same. I, I don't know, but I don't think what his big board looks like should matter at all to you or to the Carolina Panthers when it comes draft time, as far as who the Panthers decide to choose. Like, yes, they should choose players who they liked and they loved JC Horn. And I had spoken to people leading up to the draft asking around, all right, who do you think the Panthers are going to take? And I came up here and I told y'all days before the draft that I felt like the Panthers were going to take JC Horn. Now I did not think they were going to take him at eight. I thought they were going to trade back and then select him in like, the mid teens, like around 15th or something in that draft. Instead, they stayed put right at eight and took him. And then right behind him, Denver took Patrick, Patrick Sertain also from the sec playing at Alabama, whose dad also played in the NFL. So both of them have the bona fides as far as coming from NFL pedigree. And one of them has proven to be a player that can stay healthy and has also been a better player, even when both of them are on the field. And I still think J.C. Horn can be a Pro Bowl caliber player in Carolina. It's unfortunate that he gets run for that game on Sunday. Uh, it looked like the offensive line pushed him first, but either way, I think that's just frustration bowling over from, from, from J.C. when they are not stopping anybody yet again and just everything that's gone on his career here in Carolina through four seasons. Like I totally get it. His availability has been the biggest issue while Sertain has been available and he's been outstanding. And yeah, I think he's a better player than JC Horn. Now, will JC Horn be able to stay healthy and then turn out to show that he's a pretty damn good player too? That's the hope here in Carolina. Michael Par Micah Parsons obviously has been great in Dallas. Uh, the way Dan Quinn used him is a huge reason. Also, just his overall talent. Like, there's a lot of questions back there in that draft. Should the Panthers take Justin Fields? I know a lot of y'all want to see the Panthers take Justin Fields, even though the Panthers flat out told you they weren't interested in any of these quarterbacks because they had already brought in Sam Darnold via trade. They gave up three draft picks to get Sam Darnold. And people were still sitting here talking, oh, go get Justin Fields like that was going to happen. And Justin Fields didn't play well in Chicago. And so far, things have been better for him in Pittsburgh. But I think there's still questions of whether he's actually going to be the guy there for the Steelers or if he is a uh, – franchise caliber quarterback in the NFL. He's getting a second opportunity with an organization where he can have a chance, but it's not like his receiving core is that great uh, in the first place. But still, that, that was a conversation, but I was sitting up here saying like, Panay Sewell, we riot. And the Detroit Lions took him seventh overall. And had Panay Sewell been sitting there at eight, the Carolina Panthers would have taken him. And there really would be no concern because I think Panay Sewell is a hell of a player. And he has shown so far in Detroit, with one of the best offensive lines there is in the NFL, that he is a hell of a player. So it just comes down to circumstance. I think the circumstance was they, they wanted Sewell. He wasn't there. They loved Horn. He was there, and they took him. He just has not been healthy. And a guy who also plays the same position, Pat Sertain, has been pretty doggone good and has also been healthy, and that kind of leads to questions like this, Rod. So I don't want to say it's the wrong selection, but clearly, like, there are two guys drafted behind him that play defense. And this is a bad defense who 
could have helped the Panthers. And I think probably, I don't know, you never know what would have happened, whether they stayed healthy and whether things would have worked, worked out them, for them in Carolina. But it's it's hard to look and see what you potentially could have had. Anthony with the final question here on the mailbag saying, if we end up getting the top pick because of injuries, do you think a team will be desperate enough to give us a first rounder to move up for their franchise quarterback? I can see that being the only way we get things back on track within two years. So yeah, well, I do appreciate the sentiment that the Panthers need to trade back and get assets because that's where I stand here in October as I'm still getting all these draft questions, which, again, I hate. Like, the football is actually happening. I get it. Team's not great. Can we can we try to enjoy real football opposed to focusing on the draft? And let's be honest, the Panthers have sucked at drafting, so I don't even know why people – I get it. Draft gives people hope, all that. Uh, this is part of the reason why I hate the draft because you get questions about it in October when it's like, why can't you just watch football? And whether it's even your, if you're not ha happy watching the Panthers, watch other teams in the NFL, watch college, watch high school, do anything except for obsess over something that's not going to happen until April. And it's only three nights. Like we get 20, what, two weeks of actual NFL football, like the regular season and in playoffs, and you get three days of the actual draft happening and we're talking about it here in October. It's insane, man. I hate it. Um, I don't know. Carson Beck looked terrible against Alabama in the first half and he came back and looked good, but I wonder if scouts gonna be like, Whoa, I don't know about that after the way he played in that first half in Tuscaloosa. I mean, Shador has been outstanding. He, that's somebody people are gonna be interested in. And other than that, like, I don't really know what quarterbacks are that appealing. And this is not considered to be a great quarterback class. And I actually, I bookmarked this because I was like, all right, I might have to get back to this at some point in time. I was looking at it on um, Twitter where some of these draft nerds um, were talking about the quarterback class and all of that. I think it was a quarterback class. Um, yeah, Jim Nagy, who is the executive director of the Senior Bowl, came out and said, uh, spoke to four NFL execs past week and said same thing about upcoming 2025 draft. There is an unusually small number of just surefire first rounders. And then um, it was quote tweeted by Dane Brugler, who then said, where is it at? I lost it. Now, yeah, but who said, yep, that was the case over the summer remains. So a month into it, it's a talented draft class, just doesn't have a ton of heavy hitters. And the absence of a top 10 pick at quarterback contributes to it, a, t a lock top 10 pick. So that kind of speaks to if there's not a lock top 10 pick at quarterback, are the Panthers who are headed to drafting the top five based off of how things are gone so far, are they going to be able to get a team to be desperate enough to give them the kind of compensation that they need in order to build this team? Because you look at Chicago, we know about the draft and the, the trade and all that, or you have Caleb Williams who comes from that because Panthers ended up not being very good and that number one pick uh, this past year went to them, and they obviously took Darnell Wright as well. Uh, they got Torrey Taylor, their punter. They got Tariq Stevenson, their corner, and they're going to get another player here in the second round coming up, and then, of course, got DJ Moore. So it's a bunch of guys that are contributing just based off of one team's desperation to get a quarterback. And, yeah, Anthony, you want to know, will the Panthers find another sucker? Well, you better hope that, like, someone like, like Shador or some other quarterback – goes out there and just looks ridiculous for the next month and a half in college and forces a team to just want to give up the world for him. But what we're seeing that did not work out when the Broncos gave up the world for Russell Wilson did not work out when the Browns gave up the world for Deshaun Watson has not worked out for the Carolina Panthers who gave up the world for Bryce Young. Eventually these teams will learn that you're better off just trying to build through the draft get the quarterback when it makes the rights the most sense and not give up a ton of assets. But hopefully for Carolina, they'll find a sucker just like the sucker they were a couple years ago. All right, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Lockdown Panthers podcast for the Lockdown Podcast Network. Hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Again, y'all subscribe, follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter at Julian Council, where on Wednesdays, like today, I answer your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions. Best time to get them in to me is following the game on Sunday and all the way up to about 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday afternoon. But in the meantime, be safe. Be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding. And on tomorrow's show, it's Crossover Thursday presented by our friends over at Price Picks with our friend Aaron Freeman of Locked on Falcons. We'll talk to him about whether the Falcons can pull another one out of their ass this Sunday or the Panthers are going to go ahead and beat those dirty birds. Talk to you Thursday.